Morning, Chandler. Good morning. Glad to see all of you remember to turn your clocks ahead last night. Of course, it's uh, spring ahead, but I feel like more like I've sprung a leak when I lose this hour of sleep. A few announcements before we begin. The RCW women will meet in the back of the sanctuary right after the service for a short meeting. Please uh, don't forget, otherwise Patsy's going to have to come hunt you down. Special offering today is Hope Haven. And next month's special offering, instead of having it on the second Sunday, will actually be on the first Sunday. Um, so the first Sunday of April will be for special offering. That's because the second Sunday of April is Palm Sunday, and we're going to have a special combined service with our... Christian Reformed Church neighbors, as well as we'll be welcoming the Claussons for special music. The uh, Claussons are a musical family from Worthington, and we're very happy to have them come and sing and play for us on Palm Sunday. 
We are in the season of Lent, and that means we're doing our Wednesday Lent prayer. Um, so on Wednesdays, 5.30, of course, is bell practice, and then at 6.30, we have our Lenten prayer service. This Wednesday evening, my wife will be leading it because my daughter and I will be at a father-daughter event in Edgerton that evening. What? <laughs> Apparently yep. that's news for her. But <laughs> classes met this past Thursday. Um, on one hand, I'm glad it was a nice short meeting, but on the other hand, I feel like we probably should have discussed more of the events that have been going on with RCA. Uh, not a lot of highlights to bring back to you. Um, but probably the most pertinent for Chandler is the fact that I am now the class's vice president. So Pastor Mark and Edgerton and myself make up the leadership team of classes this year. Please pray for us. As I mentioned, there's a lot going on in our denomination that requires discussion. Uh, the elders and I have been planning, <coughs> looking into the everything that's been happening, I assure you that we are taking this very seriously. I want to pass on some of the wisdom our elders have in reminding us all that our salvation belongs to Jesus. There is a lot in this world, both in our nation and our denomination, that frustrates us and even hurts us. Sometimes it feels like a betrayal. But it's important to remember in these trying times that our salvation belongs to Jesus, and we will wait upon the Lord. As we wait and listen, part of that process is having a, I don't really want to call it a congregational meeting because that has specific rules associated with that, but in April, April 24th, uh, we're going to have, we're going to get together as a congregation to discuss some of the pathways that the elders and I have been discussing, as well as to get feedback and questions from you all. <clears throat> and with that, brothers and sisters, let us bring before our Lord both our praises and our worries, for he is a mighty God who is able to save us with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm. As we prepare to worship our Lord, let us begin with the reading of Psalm 134 and Psalm 135. If I can. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth, bless you from Zion. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own, Israel to be his treasured possession. I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him, in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of men and animals. He sent his signs and wonders into your midst, O, o Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants. He struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. And he gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his people Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, through all generations. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, praise the Lord. O house of Aaron, praise the Lord. O house of Levi, praise the Lord. You who fear him, praise the Lord. Praise be to the Lord from Zion, to him who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise 
the Lord. Brothers and sisters, will you join me in praising the Lord by rising and singing together number 597, Take My Life and Let It Be. sisters in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. 
He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out to the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He heard and saw me my mouth, a man of grace to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you plan for us. None can bear for you, for I seek the tell of your deeds, they will be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened, burnt offerings and sif offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Comfort me, Lord, to know me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May, the, may those who say to me, Aha! Aha! be appalled at their shame. But may all who seek to you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, The Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. People of God, let us go before our Lord, our great help and deliverer, and make a confession of our sins. For God is mighty to save. Let us pray. Holy God, maker of heaven and earth, you have set your Son, Jesus Christ, upon the throne. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace and Lord of Lords, you reign over our lives, and you have sent us your Holy Spirit. And we confess in the Spirit, O Lord, that we have not kept your law perfectly. We have not perfectly followed your ways. We do not love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we often ignore our neighbor. And we do not love them as ourselves. Jesus Christ, I confess our sins. I confess when we are selfish and proud, when we become distracted by the worries of the world and we no longer proclaim your goodness and your gospel. Please forgive our weak hands and our faltering steps. Forgive us when we seek our own kingdom and turn our backs on your own. Call us back to you, Jesus, when we get stuck in the mire of this world. Pull us out of the muck of sin and place us on the strong rock of your word. Create in us a new heart, hearts that are loving and forgiving and generous, hearts that are strong enough to pray for our enemies and to love those who persecute us. O oh Lord, deliver us from sin, Satan, and death and restore us to your presence and the joy of your salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters.
Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who should ever believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, let us rise and sing together. 367, Christ the Lord is risen today. Our scripture reading today is Hebrews chapter 10. But first, let us pray that the Spirit may illumine our reason. Holy Father, Holy Son, and the Holy Ghost, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be filled with wisdom and knowledge and love, that your word to us, O Lord, may be a light for our feet and a light for our feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. 
With burnt offerings and sin offerings you are not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my, ma I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is the body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days. After you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. This is the word of the Lord. Many of my best childhood memories are camping with my family. I have memories of setting up tents, going on hikes, going boating, and of course, being rained on. But probably my favorite memories are those of starting the campfire. I have started fires in at least a dozen different states. 
Now, when we went camping with my parents, we would sleep in the tents. If I was camping with my grandparents, we would sleep in their RV. When I went camping with my high school friends, we wanted to do real camping, which means we went out to the middle of nowhere, also known as Eastern Oregon, with nothing but our sleeping bags and the stars above. And now, as I've gotten older, I find it more difficult to do real camping. Staying at a KOA is the closest to roughing it I've done in quite a long time. Because, well, I like having clean water come out of my tap. I like having electricity and a warm bed to sleep in at night. Which is not to say that having an RV is wrong, but if the point of camping is to get away from the stress of society and get back to nature, to experience, to see and to hear and to smell and feel and even taste the wild, well then, the more conveniences we bring, the farther away from the point we get. After all, it's hard to see the stars when every campsite is lit up with electric lights. Again, there's nothing wrong with having an RV. But the point I want you to see is that it's possible to become overloaded with conveniences that we miss our original purpose. So it is with our walk with God. When we go camping, we bring tools with us to help us survive out in nature. And if religion is like camping, then our religious practices are tools we bring with us to help us live a faithful life out in the world. But just like camping, we can become so overloaded with conveniences and luxuries that we forget our original purpose. Indeed, it's possible for a person to become so overwhelmed with conveniences that it's difficult to tell the difference between a person who is faithfully walking with God and a person who is walking in the world. But to better understand that, let us take another look at Hebrews chapter 10. Please excuse my stuffy nose today. Now the point we, I've been reiterating for these past 10 weeks is that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than literally everything. Not only is he better in quality, Jesus is better in power. He's better than the angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua, better than Aaron and all the high priests. Jesus is even better than the law. So, chapter 10, Paul is concluding his argument about why Jesus is better and why or how that knowledge should influence our behavior out in the world. Now, if you were a faithful Jew, you would have been studying the Torah every single day of your life. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is what we refer to as the law. So when we refer to the law, yes, we're talking about the portions of Deuteronomy where it spells out, you know, do this, don't do that, and of course the Ten Commandments. But for Jews, and let me remind you, Paul is a Jew, the law is everything written in the first five books of the Bible. Why is this important? Well, because for Jews, there are two generations that help define who they are as a people. In Exodus, we see God with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm deliver his people out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That is the first generation. They are the ones that God saved, that God delivered. The irony is that this generation that God saved is also the generation that perished in the wilderness. Why did they perish? Well, because of their unbelief, their idolatry and adultery, and how they grumbled and complained against Moses and God. That is the first generation. The second generation, their children, is the generation that enters into the Promised Land. To help every generation of Jew, Jew, every generation of Jews have two festivals they celebrate to help them remember these two generations and to guide their lives 
in living a faithful life. Passover, of course, is when they remember what it was like to be slaves in Egypt and being delivered by God. And later on, there is the Feast of Tabernacles, when they remember how they used to live in tents before they entered into the Promised Land. As, and so when we read chapter 10, we should read this chapter in light of these two generations, because that's going to help us determine all these really scary passages that Paul is talking about here. And specifically, later on, when he encouraged us to enter in, he's encouraging us to be that second generation that entered into God's promised land. But again, Jesus is better. We're not entering into a geographic promised land, but we are entering into the better promised land that is Jesus Christ. So what was the problem that the, the Israelites had when they are in Egypt? Well, they had lived in Egypt so long that they started to look like the Egyptians. They were there for 300 years. Now, using the United States as an example, this country is often referred to as the melting pot. It doesn't take 300 years for a generation of immigrants to eventually look like the rest of the United States. I mean, just think about our own family history. I know my grandparents, they came to the United States back in the 50s. And well, two generations later, I look like just a regular American citizen. After 300 years, how much more assimilation must have happened to the people of Israel? They were living in Egypt, eating Egyptian food, baking Egyptian bread, building Egyptian buildings, and even worshipping Egyptian gods. Yes, it's true, they were still Hebrews. You could still tell the difference between an Egyptian and a Hebrew if you lived there. But if we were to go back in time, I'm sure we would have difficulty telling the two people apart. After all, when God had rescued the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt, they kept remembering what life was like back in, back in their homeland. After all, that's where they were born. That's what they considered to be their homes for so long. And they quickly forgot about all the persecution and the slavery and the justice that they suffered. Now, they were remembering their food and their festivals and how they used to just sit along the banks of the Nile River and relax. Not like out in the wilderness where you have to work, 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 trying to find water. Granted, God gave them food, but they still didn't have time to rest. They had to move around from place to place wherever God led them. And so the point of the wilderness journey is that God was teaching his people, remaking them so that they didn't look like Egyptians, Instead, they started to look like God's people, to look like the children of God. And if you're a children of God, well, just like our children look like their parents, so also the children of God will eventually begin to look like God himself. This is the point of the law. This is the point of all their festivals, all their sacrifices and rituals, is to stop looking like the people of the world and start looking like God. Unfortunately, as Paul observes, none of these sacrifices, even though they are commanded by the law, are actually capable of cleansing us of our sins and fashioning, making us into a people of God. We need a better law, a better sacrifice for that to happen. Again, let me remind you, baked into the law that God gave his people, baked into their tabernacle and all the religious practices, was the reminder of sin and the fact that the people of Israel could not enter into the Holy of Holies. They couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies, they had to keep making sacrifices, and their priests never sat down. The priests never sat down because the work was never done. By comparison, we read, Jesus is able to sit down. He sits down because his sacrifice is the once for all sacrifice that gets the job done. Jesus is better. And because Jesus is better, he is worthy of making a new law and opening up a way into the Holy of Holies, a way that is open for all of us to enter in. So therefore, brothers and sisters, enter into the Holy of Holies. 
by passing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, of course, this is easier said than done. Just as it's easier to say, obey God's commands. We still need to grow and mature. As Paul writes in verse 14, because of the one sacrifice, Jesus has made us perfect forever. But he also notes that we are still being made holy. We are not quite holy yet. We're still in the process of being made. And just as God gave certain laws and festivals for the people of Israel to follow, so also our Lord Jesus gives us sacraments to follow. These are tools to help us grow in our faith, to practice making our confession out in the world. Jesus makes a new covenant with us. We remember this covenant every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is a covenant we engage in when we baptize our children, or perhaps we ourselves have been baptized. This is why I want to remind us every week of our baptism. Remind us that we are part of a covenant made with God. We are not just people wandering out in the world, just randomly bouncing from event to event. No, we are a called people, and Jesus has made a covenant with us. And as long as Jesus is alive and sitting on the throne of heaven, that covenant will never be broken. You know what? I want to say that one more time. As long as Jesus is alive and sitting on the throne of heaven, that covenant will never be broken. Amen. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but that knowledge gives me such confidence and such strength. Because the world is scary. Turn on the news and you can see examples of it. War in Ukraine, high inflation. There is a massive amount of people coming into the United States. The fact that there are so many immigrants, both legal and those who are trying to come in by any means necessary, is a sign that there is hurt in the world. After all, if there was no hurt in the world, why would we leave a home? Can't imagine just what kind of poverty and danger they are playing in order to rush up 2,000 miles on foot to enter into a country that probably doesn't want them there. And yet the risks they face are apparently worth the sacrifices in order to get into a country where, well, the American dream can be found. Brothers and sisters, we live in a country full of opportunities and rights and privileges. It's no wonder thousands and millions of people want to live here, because those rights and privileges don't exist in every country. And yet, let me remind you, these rights and privileges that we have as American citizens, at the end of the day, these are just conveniences and luxuries. These aren't necessary things for our salvation. Look at the nation of China. Those citizens don't have our rights. They don't have our privileges and conveniences. I most certainly want to live here in the United States and not China, and I'm not going to leave here anytime soon. And yet, it is also true that there are many more Christians living in China than are alive in the United States today. This raises the question, how can this be so? Well, later on in verse 35, Paul writes something surprising. Starting in verse 32, he says, Remember those earlier days after you received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. And then he lists their persecutions, how they had their property taken, how they stood with those in prison. Paul calls this their confidence. What is the great confidence of faith that they have? Why is the fact that they were persecuted? And he reminds them to not throw away their confidence. Now, this is important because right before this assurance, he gives this big, long paragraph full of judgment. He says, you better enter in through Jesus or else you're going to receive punishment. This is scary. Is it possible that we're not saved? 
How do we know if we're actually in communion with Jesus Christ? Well, this is why it's important to remember those two generations. The generation that perished in the wilderness is the same generation that God saved from slavery. They didn't stop being God's people. God continued to keep covenant with the people of Israel despite their unbelief and their idolatry and adultery and all of their grumbling and complaining. God's faithfulness continued from generation to generation, and it was the second generation that entered in. So whenever we see passages of judgment, it's important to remember that God judges those he loves, and he does so in order to make them holy. So what are some ways that God disciplines his people? Well, for those ancient Israelites, it was because they wandered in the wilderness, and, well, had a camp with God for 40 years without running water, without crops. They had their sheep and their goats and their cattle with them, but, well, they weren't able to enjoy the meat from these animals. They had to keep them alive to carry all their stuff. They suffered persecution. They were attacked by the nations of the world. That was their confidence. The confidence for the first Christians was being kicked out of synagogues for having their property confiscated. They were thrown into jail. Many of them were beaten and flogged and even put to death. That was the great confidence they had that they were in God's hands, that they were part of his covenant. And so, if you are enjoying privileges and luxuries and conveniences, chances are you're not suffering persecutions. You know, just like having an RV is not a bad thing when you want to be camping, so also living in a nation of rights and privileges is not a bad thing. But we should not lose sight of the point. Our job is to look like God, not to look like the world. As American citizens, we should engage with our nation and uphold our rights and our duties as American citizens. Participate in the economy, participate in elections, advocate for the laws that we want to see passed. But at the end of the day, that is not our identity. Our identity is grounded in God. Our identity is based upon Jesus Christ. Since we've been washed with his water and washed by his blood, and we participate in the body of Christ, we begin to look like God. We go out of the world confessing the good news of Jesus Christ. We forgive people. We don't hold grudges. We don't look at somebody who's from a different political party and point our fingers at them. Rather, we obey the commands of Jesus. We love our enemies, and we pray for those who persecute us. Brothers and sisters, the world needs us to fulfill our calling to be a royal priesthood. The world needs us to pray for it. The people out there who aren't in church needs us to pray to God on their behalf. What hope do they have? Because they don't even know Jesus. They might have heard the name of Jesus, but they don't have the good news. So what hope do they have? Their only hope is if we extend the gospel of God to them. We pray for them, praying that the Holy Spirit will renew their hearts and their minds and bring them into the covenant of Jesus Christ. This is a high calling and something that we can't accomplish. At least we can't accomplish it by our own. We can only accomplish this when we pass through the curtain, that is Jesus Christ, and enter in the Holy of Holies. Only there will we be made perfect. Only there can we be made holy. And only there can we acquire the food, the bread of the presence, and carry out the Holy Spirit into the world. So brothers and sisters, live by faith. Enter into the Holy of Holies, and then go out in the world being faithful servants of God. Remember, we are a royal priesthood in the order of Jesus Christ. So when we go out to the world, I encourage you to hold on to the world with open hands. Don't grasp on to our rights and our privileges. Don't grasp on to the things that are good, like our farms and our families, but rather hold on to them with open hands. 
Let the world see the good things that God has done for us, not with clenched fists that look like, well, as if we're about to punch somebody, but rather with open hands, offering grace and forgiveness to a world that's in desperate need of both. And so I encourage you during this time of Lent to go camping with God. Just as the Israelites every year would leave their homes and go camping in the wilderness to remember what life was like as that generation living outside the promised land. So also, let go of our privileges and our rights and live a life that demonstrates our faithfulness and our hope in God. Open your hands. Let God give you his good gifts and then give those good gifts to the world. And in that way, brothers and sisters, you will boldly enter in to the better promised land that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Holy Father, I thank you for sending us your Son. Jesus Christ, I thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I thank you for growing good fruits in our lives, for giving us the gifts of faith, hope, and love. And I pray, Lord, that we will share these fruits of love, joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness to all the world, to both our family and our friends, to the people in our church, and to our neighbors, and even to strangers, so that your name will be praised. Now and forever we pray. As a hymn of response, we please rise and sing number 393, Breathe on Me, O Breath of God. At this time, we invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, once again, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to your house and worship and praise you. We ask now, Lord, that you will bless the offering which we are about to receive. May we use it in a manner that is pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather which thou sent us. Thank you for the sunshine. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
today, and we thank you, dear God, for bringing us here to your house to worship and praise you and glorify your name on this beautiful day. We thank you that you were with Pastor Seth as he brought us your word. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all those who are in our rest areas or our rest homes at this time, Lord. We pray that you will be with Jack and Nell and Dorothy. We pray that you will be with them and bless them in, in their day to day activities, be with those caregivers who are helping to take care of them, and we just um, pray that your will be done. We also pray, Lord, that you will be with our missionaries, Ronnie and Beth, the Hewers, and the Lord Silvis. We pray, Lord, that you will be with them uh, as they are out in a very dangerous world at this time. We Lord, pray, Lord, that you will keep them safe. We pray that you will help them to bring your word to, to the people that they are, are uh, trying to reach. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless their ministry and, and watch over them and guide them and protect them. We also pray, Lord, that you will be with those of, that we know who are sick or who have uh, health concerns. We pray, Lord, that you will be with Grace and Linda Stephen and Angus Johnson. We pray, Lord, that you will give them comfort. We pray, Lord, that you will watch over them and, and, and ease their pain, if the pain that they have, or just be with them from day to day. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings and opportunities that you give us. We pray, Lord, that you will um, continue to be with our church. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the leaders of our church and our denomination. We pray, Lord, that you will um, help them to, to be able to come and make wise decisions. We pray also, Lord, that you will be with those of us who have decisions to make here in our own church. We pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom as well. Give us guidance, and we, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that we have that we may come and serve you and, and praise and glorify your name. And we want to continue to do that, Lord, in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you. We also come to you in this day, Lord, praying for all those who are suffering. We pray, Lord, for countries that are being destroyed through war. We pray for uh, lives, innocent lives that are being lost. And we just pray, Lord, that you will be with all those. We pray, Lord, that you will be with any and every country that is going through persecution at this time. And we pray, Lord, that that you will help those that uh, are doing the persecuting and causing the suffering, that you will help them to have thoughts and that they may pull back and that that uh, they will, they will uh, be sympathetic for those that they are causing harm to. We pray, Lord, that you will be with our, our world. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with the leaders of our nation. We pray, Lord, that you will give them wisdom and, and uh, insight into what is right. We pray, Lord, that, that uh, we, we want to uh, protect what is ours, but we also want to keep in mind those that, that uh, need help. And we pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom to our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you will give wisdom to all of our leaders, whether it be nationwide or even at home here, we pray, Lord, that you will help us in all that we do. Forgive us now of our many sins. Be with us throughout this coming week. We pray, Lord, that uh, the words we heard today, that we may go out and, and use them to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Let us conclude our time of prayer by singing our doxology. sisters, you are a called people, and you live by faith. Therefore, walk with Jesus and be his royal priests in the world in this coming week.
Let us conclude our time of worship by singing 245, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. Amen. 